Welcome to the second webinar for the on-farm grain storage two-part webinar series. Today, let's have a chat about permanent grain storage structures. Let's focus on cone and flat bottom silo types and also have a look at the management around grain sheds. My name is Wendy Gill and I'm the Mixed Farming Officer based at Forbes. It's my pleasure to be one of your facilitators today on behalf of the state local land services ag advisory team. For participants today, let's have a quick look at all the nuts and bolts on how to make your webinar platform engaging for today's session. Co-facilitating with me today is Nerily Brennan, the team leader ag services based in Dubbo. If you need any assistance with your audio or log on issues, during the webinar, please contact myself or Nerily. Our details are at the bottom of your screen. On your right hand side of your screen as participants, you will see your control panel. You can use the orange button to expand and collapse this control panel for your preferred view. Today, participants have access to handout resources and these were also emailed directly to any participant who registered before one o'clock yesterday. All participants I have currently got muted. Today's webinar will be recorded so you can catch up and re-listen on any component of the webinar content at a later date. Feel free at any time to type in any of your questions and also to send a comment to the panel about any discussion points you'd like covered. We'll go through that content of those questions in your question and answer time a bit later in the session today. I'd warmly like to welcome back our presenters, Philip Burrell and Bill Gordon for today's webinar. And if you're joining us today for the first time, Philip Burrell is a Senior Development Agronomist with AgriScience Department of Primary in Department of Agriculture and Fisheries at Queensland. He's based at the Hermitage Research Centre at Warwick. Philip works with the leading post-harvest grain research team and specialises in stored grain pest control. He also heads up and leads the Northern Regions component of the GRDC's National Grain Storage Extension Project, working with advisors, growers and agribusiness. Also presenting and speaking today is Bill Gordon. Bill is based at Orange and is a New South Wales Grains Biosecurity Officer, working with New South Wales Department of Prime Ministries in the Grains Farm Biosecurity Program. This is supported by Grains Producers Australia and is managed by Plant Health Australia. Bill comes to us with more than 20 years experience in the grains industry as a private consultant where he worked on delivering extension and research in crop protection and also pesticide application. I'm really excited to be able to have both gentlemen here today to present. And it's my pleasure to hand over to Philip to start today's presentation. Thanks, Philip. Thank you, uh, Wendy, and a particular thank you to yourself, Wendy, and to Narrowly and the rest of your team there at Local Land Services. You've put an enormous amount of work into uh, getting these two uh, webinar uh, series together. So but, uh, thank you very much for, um, yes, thank you very much for doing that. Um, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. And look, just a very brief overview of um, where I sit uh, as, <clears throat> pardon me, um, as I, and based at Warwick at the Hermitage Research Station. However, I'm part of the GRDC's National Grain Storage Extension Project. And uh, you can see the aim there to improve grain storage results for producers and the industry, uh, particularly with a focus on uh, controlling the pest storage pests and grain quality. The extension team, Chris Warwick, uh, very capably uh, manages and coordinates the team from Horsham in Victoria. And he does covers the those areas there, Victoria, South Australia, and Tasmania. I'm responsible for the GRDC's northern area, New South Wales, Queensland, and Ben uh, also does all of uh, Western Australia. Research teams: um, um, a third of my time is spent uh, uh, with the research team in Brisbane. This is 
uh, the largest of the post-harvest grain storage research teams in Australia. Uh, but there's also <clears throat> very capably managed um, Joe Holloway at Wagga Wagga and also uh, at Murdoch University in Western Australia. Uh, Yong Lin Ren uh, has a group there. You can see a snapshot of my general activities, workshops, as I mentioned, research. And then, look, I would certainly uh, direct you to this website. Uh, there are a lot of uh, helpful resources, information resources, uh, video clips uh, uh, on aeration, fumigation, etc. Uh, so if, uh, and it has a very uh, useful little um, a search engine within that uh, website, so I point you to that. But if you have specific inquiries, you'd like to talk to any three of us, Chris, myself or Ben, just ring that hotline, 1-800-WEEVIL, and uh, that comes straight to our mobile phone number. So we're happy to hopefully help you with inquiries there. All right, well, look, I'm regularly asked um, around this uh, topic of um, you know what is what is the um, um, best type of storage on farm, and as most of you are well aware, particularly when we occasionally get these bigger harvests, it's usually the mix of storage that makes things work best on farm. So, in this webinar, we are concentrating on the uh, storages, both flat bottoms, cone base, and the grain sheds, uh, but uh, we know in these sorts of seasons uh, where we uh, get a little bit more, we're going to be using temporary uh, storages, pads, uh, possibly silo bags, grain rings, um, and even grain pits. Um, but look, it really comes down to the grain types you're storing, the segregations you need within those grain types, be it on the basis of protein, screenings, etc. storage times, um, and how you might be marketing your grain. All right, look, I'd just like to run through this slide quickly again. Uh, we did this in the uh, Wednesday webinar, but there's some points there. Look, for most of you, I'm sure, um, you've covered off on most of these before harvest, but just in case there's one or two things there that you might think you'd like to do for this particular harvest, uh, let's run through it very quickly. Very important talking to your potential grain buyers and the traders, you know, just to clarify how you're going to segregate during the harvest time, on what you know, what are the key segregations buyers and traders are looking for? Even moisture contents, some allow a little bit more feedlots, etc. The grain protectants, you know, I, I know quite a few growers are heading down this path of using grain protectants this year, but please make sure you've had a discussion with uh, your potential grain buyers prior to using it. As all of us are aware, there's certain parcels of grain um, and certain markets that would prefer there's no residues. Your grain testing equipment, you know, when was the last time your moisture meter was serviced? I would encourage you to look at <clears throat> grain temperature probes. Um, look, when you're holding grain for any length of time, you know, beyond two months, you really, it's quite informative, not only sieving and trapping insects, uh, to, de to detect a growing problem, but the grain temperature actually t allows you to interpret, uh, you know, how active those insects are going to be. And if in the case of aeration on your silos or grain sheds, <clears throat> it also allows you to um, see how well your aeration system is actually performing. Grain quality samples, again here, when I used to work for a bulk handler some many years ago, we always had a 20 litre bucket that actually represented a particular storage or silo. So when we were sampling from trucks, there would be a subsample taken from our uh, speed sample and put into the 20 litre bucket, and that would say be the representative bucket for silo number three. That is really helpful for understanding your final grain quality in each of your silos or your grain shed, etc. Grain storage records, look, uh, this is a real must in this day and age. You know, when you're filling out commodity vendor decks, 
Uh, you really should have a record, be it electronic or hard copy. Um, just within that, please make sure each of your storages, each silo actually has a, a clearly labelled number. We all know that I'm sure we've all had this problem at times where grain's been taken out of the wrong silo or put into the wrong silo. So try and uh, make sure those things uh, are less of a problem this year. Hygiene, I shouldn't really have to say, and I'm most growers do an excellent job here, but just try not to forget you know, that one ton bag of gratings or some other older parcels of seed that are still sitting in a shed. Just remember, and also if you're going to do a good clean up and you dump that grain up the paddock, just remember if it's in a pile uh, of old grain dumped up the paddock, most of the storage pests have the capability of flying around one kilometre range. Um, so they will certainly fly back to your newly harvested grain. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> again, I shouldn't really need to say this, testing your, all your grain handling equipment, augers, etc. But please, I would, if you're going to be using grain protectants, please initially just fill your uh, grain spray equipment up with water, check your nozzles obviously, and then calibrate it for the, you know, the height that you're going to be running your auger. So you do get that one litre of mix per tonne uh, and uh, you don't, underdo it or overdo it. Test run your aeration fans on your silos, you know, just to say no electrical faults, etc. cetera. Um, probably check if you've got an automatic controller, hopefully you're working in that direction to have one of those. Just check that the temperature and the relative humidity sensor on the controller is actually reading correctly. A little handheld unit will soon help you with that. Order your, any grain protectants you're requiring, fumigation products. Grain contamination, just watch that, you know, mice around grain sheds, um, you know, particularly where vegetation is close to your sheds. Uh, oil on the floor, M most of us, you know, in the off season will store machinery in these grain sheds and yeah, bolts, anything, any bits of old steel, obviously those need to be well and truly cleaned up. Um, Peter Botter, a very uh, dear colleague who we lost a couple of years ago based in Victoria, used to remind me, and it's a very uh, good thing to keep in mind, really we should treat our grain as as food. And uh, I think it couldn't be better, uh, more accurate because it's either food for you and I or food for stock. Um, hope not, uh, but um, if we do have an up rain interrupted harvest, what is it that you can actually organise now in preparation if we have rain interruptions? It might be, making sure you had at least one or two silos that have aeration and that before the rain front hits, you can take off some slightly higher moisture grain um, and keep that prior to um, a major rain front coming through during harvest. All right, look, if I only ever put up one slide, this would be the slide that I would use. I, I call this my four foundation points, if you like, uh, for successful grain storage on farm. Uh, regular monitoring, so we should be checking every month um, using the, our little uh, insect probe trap that gets pushed in the grain and left in the grain and pulled up once a month. Getting a, a grain sample maybe out of the bottom of the silo or using a grain spear um, as, as, yep, in the shed to get a sample and sieving it with a two mil uh, uh, mesh sieve. We need to check when the insects are first arriving. The combination of those are, is a thorough way of checking for pests. So the sieve, the trap, identify it, use one of GRDCs, or um, you'll see um, Bill in, his, in the next session will show you a little booklet, another identification book. Use one of those uh, readily available booklets for identifying those insects. There's really only six or seven major storage pests in Australia. Um, all right, check your grain temperature. That helps, as I mentioned, interpret how urgent the fumigation is and also tells you about your aeration, as mentioned. Hygiene, we've covered that. Just remember, it's actually the bits and pieces of old uh, timber or other upturned equipment near your storages that is is a suitable shelter for these pests. Um, so 
really the physical clean is, is a major part of hygiene. Um, not just using, relying on, say, a good product like Dryside, uh, Diatomaceous Earth is the, the general name, uh, but the physical clean, washing out, using air, whatever, that is that is a key part of um, hygiene, getting rid of those old residues. Aeration cooling, I'm sure most of us are aware, cooler grain temperatures really slow down these insect pests. Um, another good aspect in your silo when you're filling a silo all of us know that really there's quite a reasonable variation in moisture content when we're harvesting in most paddocks um, when you place that grain in the silo using aeration helps you get uniformity of grain moisture throughout the the bulk of the grain and also many of us are aware that when you cool grain you actually hold some valuable quality aspects don't you germination is held colour of chickpeas, it doesn't go dark quickly when you cool the grain. Um, so a lot of valuable aspects around cooling grain. And lastly, fumigation, we really must stay with sealable gas tight storages to get effective fumigation. And really when we have storage pests, live storage insects in our grain, it is actually fumigation that is the only option, registered option in Australia. Grain protectants, if you're going to be using them, we're going to have a quick look at that in, in the last slide. All right, let's dive into the preparations um, prior to harvest. Um, and this applies to all of our storages on farm. Look, one, this particular uh, on-farm storage system I've got some photos of here. You can see the um, storage system, they've got their grain shared, um, they have a few sites for grain uh, bunkers. They're, here's their weighbridge. You'll notice the truck sampling stand, so from the truck coming off the paddock from the headers uh, is sampled. There's a little uh, small donger here which is air conditioned and inside there, <clears throat> firstly you point out, we spoke about when you've talk, spoken to your grain buyers, you've got an idea a much clearer idea of how you're going to segregate the grain at harvest. And look, here on this whiteboard, inside the actual quality shed uh, next on the Weybridge here, we've got a very clear outline of what grain is going into each particular silo. In this case, I remember these two silos were holding the higher moisture grain, so anything above, and they had additional uh, larger uh, aeration fans fitted so they could get higher air flows to safely hold slightly over moisture grain. But the other others of these silos were different proteins, different uh, screenings levels, etc. Inside the, this same room, you can see the board up here. Here's your quality testing equipment, you know, the, the uh, NIR equipment, the um, screening sieve. And here underneath the, the bench are all the individual 20 litre buckets, each of them representing an individual silo, or possibly one or two buckets representing a bucket, uh, sorry, a bunker or grain shed. So just be aware those end of the season, end of the harvest samples representing each storage, very valuable information when it comes to your sales. Here's, you know, on the wall also, I noticed there was uh, the up to date uh, grain. Stand, quality standards charts for the wheat, the barley, the chickpeas, etc. Um, and yeah, so just there are basic steps we can take to ensure that at the end of our harvest, we know exactly what is in each storage and we've segregated to suit the market. Let's dive into the hygiene for the uh, silos and grain shed. As I mentioned, the physical clean, really important uh, inside your silos and storages. And uh, there's a number of ways you can do that. I mentioned the old, uh, you know, gradings or other, um, even old carryover planting seed. Be very careful that that's not infested. Diatomaceous earth. I just wanted to briefly touch on that. So that's the currently the surface structural treatment we recommend. Why do we recommend that? Because we used to use, some of you remember, we used to use dichlorofrost spraying out silos, etc., when they're empty. 
But the good thing about diatomaceous earth, no residue problems in terms of storages that hold pulses or oil seeds or cereals. We are not aware of any pest resistance from diatomaceous earth. And generally it has some, somewhere between six and 12 months uh, of control on a surface. Kills the pests roughly three to seven days time. It really is only effective in a dry environment. So I wouldn't actually waste it on the outside of storages. It's really internal, inside equipment, inside those cleaned out uh, silos is where, and really all you try, it's nothing to do with quantity, um, just the case of try and get a good coverage over all the components. And very quickly, if I was doing this silo, it was, I physically cleaned it, I'd open the top lid, um, turn on the two aeration fans, just blow a cloud, you know, one or two seconds of that cloud of dust, diatomaceous earth into both fans. That would coat my aeration ducting. I then open this manhole at the base and deliver the rest of that uh, cloud of uh, diatomaceous earth into the silo while the aeration fans were running. And that will give me, hopefully, a nice little light coverage uh, and it really is like, just as long as you can run your finger on any surface and you can find a little bit of dust on your finger, that's all you're looking for. Um, there's some costs. Inside the header, when you've finished harvest, roughly two kilos of diatomaceous earth is an effective treatment to, because as most of us know, when a header first starts up for the season, there's almost certain to be storage pests inside that um, header because it's sheltered and there's probably a few grain residues as always inside a header. Wear the safety goggles, um, gloves, disposable dust mask. Briefly touching on aeration, um, <clears throat> just remember uh, we're gaining by reducing grain temperatures, um, slowing down the life cycle. So you really can come to the point where you actually stop the pests building up in numbers. You're not killing those pests. You're just stopping their life cycle when you get it cool enough. Helping grain quality. Look, here are the two target temperatures. It, you know, I, I sort of mentioned earlier, look at getting a grain temperature probe. And this is what we can aim for in summer. So November, December, January, February timeframes, we should be aiming for that range of grain temperatures if we are effectively running our aeration system. Winter, easily achieve under 15 um, degrees Celsius grain temperatures. And just a quick reminder, what we're doing is hopefully selecting the right air, and as I mentioned, uh, preferably using an automatic controller to run the fans, but if you're running them manually, um, then you'll need to be careful at selecting the right air and you're pushing a cooling front all the way through the depth of that grain. Um, we're aiming for, for cooling about two to four litres of air per second per tonne of uh, storage. Um, so when that silo is actually full of grain, that's the sort of air flow rate we're looking for. And we need to get the, the fan selection right, ducting appropriate, you know, as that base becomes extra wide. So on bigger silos, yes, we should probably look at having one fan opposite each other. So, sorry, two fans. Um, in smaller, you know, 70, 100 tonne silos, often it would just be sufficient to have the one duct that will give you enough air distribution. <clears throat> So running the fans at the optimum times are, is critical. And we're with good controllers, they're actually using both temperature and RH as well to select that air. And remember, an, an additional benefit to having aeration on silos uh, and other storages, you can temporarily hold damp grain for short periods, four or six weeks, by just running that fan almost continuously uh, while that grain might be one, two, possibly even three percent over safe storage, until you can blend it with dry grain or go and get it uh, grain dried uh, effectively. Uh, also, venting. So, if you've conducted a fumigation, very helpful to have the aeration. Remember, one day, one full day at least, 24 hours of running the fan after the fumigation is completed to vent um, yeah, oh, the fumigation. 
Let's look at fumigations quickly um, <clears throat> and monitoring. As I said, I'd like to see monthly checks. So using that sieve and using those grain temperature, uh, sorry, the insect probe traps, uh, check the grain temperature as mentioned and record. Please keep storage records. You, uh, it'll be a, a big assistance to your um, professional manager of your storage system on farm. Fumigation preparations. We sh should be pressure testing these silos. You know, I actually prefer to pressure test them when they're full of grain, both the comb base and the flat bottoms. Check your seals, your rubber seals are not damaged. Please use safety signs, you know, and that um, red and white safety tape when you have got a silo under fumigation. Please make it clear to everyone that is the case. And the safety sign, there's a little example, should actually have the dates you know, the dates when you started and the dates that it's due to be finished uh, and a phone number of who's conducting the fumigation. So there's standard signs that you should be looking for to use. Your PP and E gear, uh, and obviously always check the label. Um, I still check, double check on um, phosphine tin labels because there's a lot of information. So please make sure you're following the label directions. Um, just some quick, Reminders, uh, when we are looking to fumigate, more likely around late December, January, February, um, each tin, small tin of, um, for the comb base silos we're mostly referring to here, has 100 tablets. And just for uh, your information, this is written on the tins. Each tablet produces one gram of phosphine. The standard dose rate for fumigation with phosphine is one and a half grams. So that's equivalent to one and a half tablets. Um, that will do therefore 67 cubic meters of storage space. And if you multiply that by the grain density you wish to use, that's roughly fifth equivalent to 50 tons of wheat capacity. So another simple example, a 100 ton silo would require 200 tablets in terms of um, 100 ton capacity silo, 200 tablets. Just remember to always allow the time required to do the fumigation. In fact, time is the most important factor around fumigation. It's the concentration, yes, there needs to be a minimum concentration, but time is critical to get the egg, the larvae and the pupae, so the other life stages. Um, with cool grain, so hopefully it is cool because you've been aerating, you need a 10 day fumigation with phosphine with the smaller silos, uh, one day venting minimum, and then two days with holdal period. So you're looking at 13 days before it can be used, the grain. Blankets, typically used, um, say, with your um, larger storage systems. Fumifos is one brand example. You get two blankets, each of that size. Each blanket produces roughly 560 grams of phosphine. Again, that dose rate, 1.5 grams per cubic metre. You just do that calculation, therefore each blanket does about 370 cubic metres. And again, that's roughly equivalent to 290, 300 tonnes of wheat. So just remember, you'll often see for blankets on the label check, you'll see 20 days fumigation exposure required, and that's to ensure gas distribution. However, if um, you've got recirculation, that will assist in, uh, enormously with gas distribution. Remember, we really only have the silos sealed during the actual fumigation. Please do not leave silos sealed long term. It actually can structurally damage them. Um, so most silo manufacturers will say to you, please, once you finish your fumigation and you've vented, We'll go back and open up the silo and return to the normal practice of aeration cooling. Keep the aim is to make the conditions in your grain, in your storages, cool so it's unsuitable for insects to breed in, and also cool so the quality of the grain is, is held. Just be aware with that pressure testing. You know, come of the couple of the quick fault points I find occasionally with silos. The covers that are meant to seal the intake of your fans, check those. Some of the designs are not so good. Also, the vents on your roof can leak over uh, after time. So, as I say, when you do that pressure test, I'm just using a little leaf blower to add the pressure. 
and you can either use your oil bath valves to uh, do that little five minute Australian standard pressure test. But it is essential you do do pressure tests to check the silo is suited and gas tight. Here's a very quick photo of a recirculation system on this um, 1500 tonne capacity silo. We had five blankets, which was the correct dose up in the top in the headspace. We used a small motor, please only use small motors for recirculation, so a little fan. We were borrowing some of that phosphine from the headspace where the blankets were, sucking it into the fan. This is all sealed, so there's no gas leaks. Then we're blowing it just straight into, through a couple of couplings, straight into the aeration ducting in the floor of the solo. And when we compared this in a field trial, we found where we were not using recirculation, it took from the, right up the top where the blankets were, it took five days for the gas to finally arrive right down at the base here in reasonable levels. When we used the recirculation, we found we had good gas levels within 24 hours. You know, nice uniform 900 parts per million of gas uh, everywhere in the silo by simply utilising uh, a small fan to uh, close and sealed uh, to uh, circulate that air. The sheds, just touching on the sheds to finish. Um, so again, the shed hygiene, we mentioned that, just watch the floor for any old bits and pieces because we've been storing machinery in the shed. Particularly watch this one, and please, if you're going to be using baits, make sure they're well away from uh, any chance of contaminating the grain you're going to be storing. Um, Vegetation, obviously, close to a grain shed enhances the ability for mice and other things to uh, breed. Obviously, fence out the stock from the, the uh, grain shed. Uh, drainage, very important. There's a big reef area on these grain sheds. Important we've got good drainage away and we're not ending up when we have uh, rain and storms that we end up with water sitting around our grain sheds. Sadly, I've seen some grain sheds that have clearly had that problem and the floor have cracked because there's been too much moisture get under the concrete flooring. If you have cracks in the floor, please seal them up and make use of uh, diatomaceous earth again. You can mix it in with water, as many of you know, and spray it up vertical walls in a shed um, and then let it dry and it's just as effective as the dust. Aeration cooling, yes, you can obviously fit aeration cooling to sheds and that's either built at the time the flooring is poured, you have got a trench. Certainly a reasonable expense to do that, but well worth it in the long run. You need heavy perforated grates for that trench uh, aeration flooring, and you need to be able to lift those up for hygiene. Uh, I might mention too, for all your aeration flooring in your large flat bottom silos, the same applies. Please have it that you can lift those up at least uh, look, ideally once a year you clean under those because the storage pests will certainly live in there. Um, and the other choice with aeration in your sheds is of course removable piping. Please have markers on that because it, yeah, front end loads etc can very quickly destroy. I've seen quite a few of those large aeration ducts all piled up against the side of um, uh, sheds when they've been damaged. Um, you're monitoring fumigations. Again, use those insect probe traps. The ridge line in your grain shed is a good place for the probe traps. So you'll have a bit of rope on them and a nice clearly marked tag. And you'll be possibly using a grain spear as well and a bucket plus sieving some of that grain as well. Make sure that is a monthly check. Um, if you're going to be holding grain in a grain shed for an extended period, I would certainly recommend you look at those carefully at your walls. You might notice there's damage here that's been repaired in the wall. Here's another damaged spot on the on the side of a wall, and they're certainly not going to be gas tight. But when we used to set up sheds for fumigation, we'd always hang curtains. So tarps would go inside that wall, inside the corrugation, and therefore when we filled, it was a matter of then simply when fumigation was underway, the top sheet was placed there and joined to those curtain, the top of the curtain sheets. 
you're most likely going to be using phosphine blankets and a 20-day fumigation. Final, sec just about my last slide here. Um, look, grain protectants, again, just a, a reminder, please always, before you go out and apply, uh, apply lots of grain protectant, always have that discussion with who you potentially are going to sell to and check that they're okay with you applying the label rate of these couple of examples um, of grain protectant. And uh, so things are changing on a regular basis in grain markets, so please keep up to date. Uh, and that's best to talk with the traders and buyers. Um, ensure that you've, uh, as I say, calibrated your unit first with water, check your nozzles are okay, and that you are be delivering that one litre of spray mix per tonne. Try and ensure good coverage. Please note, generally speaking, if you're using a, a, a tube veyer or belt uh, com, a grain conveyor, that is not going to mix and give you the coverage you require. So if you can use a uh, auger uh, in the system where you're applying the grain protectant, that is much, uh, uh, much more efficient at getting a uniform coverage on your grain. Here's two examples called uh, Conserve Plus, k -Biol. that's the Corteva product. Is the Bayer product. Please rem remember you need to add the OP, organophosphate. The choice is Raldan, which is called pyrifos methyl, or phenytothione. Just a little warning, um, if you use the standard full rate of phenytothione, you do have a 90-day withholdal period. Um, please go and check the websites. They're both very informative, both the Corteva's website concerning Conserve Plus and Bayer's website concerning uh, KBIOL. If you can, you know, you might use, rotate that chemistry for resistance um, uh, effectiveness. So, you know, two years maybe conserved plus, maybe followed by two years or one year of KBIOL. Check your labels always. There are certainly differences between the two products here. Uh, what is registered for its use, you know, Obviously, phenytothione um, is tend to be the choice for malt rather than Raldan. Maize, they're all slightly different, so please always read your labels before applying, or if you're not sure, get advice. Um, and as I mentioned, export MRLs are regularly changing. And our final slide, um, just uh, those four points. I, I know I've passed on very quickly quite a bit of information but really when it comes down to, um, if you can do this regular monitoring and recording, hygiene, put an effort into good hygiene, where you can use your aeration cooling, and when you do need to fumigate, make, do that pressure test, make sure it is actually gas tight, and then you'll, you'll get the full life cycle and not find yourself suddenly requiring to re-fumigate within three or four weeks time. And for grain protectants, have those discussions and make sure the various parcels of grain that you do treat, it suits the market where that's going to. Thank you very much. Great, thanks for that, Phil. Um, I think we're all hoping that it's a pretty bumper season coming up and that we'll have lots of grain uh, that we do need to store. So some really important messages there. Uh, not only about preparation, but about monitoring and really managing that grain in storage over time, which is really great. Thanks for that, uh, Phil. Uh, what I did want to quickly mention was the 1800 Weevil number. So if you would like to make contact with Phil or you'd like some more information about grain storage, that, that 1800 Weevil number is there for you to access. Uh, I also wanted to mention at the end of today's webinar, there will be a very short uh, questionnaire. We hope that you can take a couple of minutes to complete that for us. It just helps us to make sure that, that we're hitting the right spot with our webinars. And if there's anything else that you'd like to hear from, please um, let us know. Uh, and with no further ado, I think we'll hand over to Bill Gordon, who will be talking to us about managing biosecurity risks at harvest. Thanks, Bill. Okay, thanks narrowly. Um, hopefully my screen's clear to everyone. Um, 
so in addition to what Phil was talking about, um, I just wanted to have a touch on, I guess, managing some of those biosecurity risks around harvest time. And usually it's a time where we have a lot of movement of things coming on and off the farm. And that's, I guess, where we have the potential to introduce pests that we may not want. So just a quick brush up on um, biosecurity and, and what it is. I guess at the end of the day, it's about trying to keep things um, out of your farm or in, in a larger case, out of the country or out of the state. So it's about trying to prevent the introduction of new pests. And I guess at harvest time, the, the key thing I, I suggest to people is think about where they may come from. So are they likely to be from a, a source already on farm that Phil mentioned, you know, cleaning up those residues? Or if you're using contractors or contract harvesters that are coming on, are they a potential source of new pests? So in terms of managing biosecurity or keeping those new pests out, obviously we want to be able to detect, detect them early. And I guess that's part of the monitoring that Phil mentioned. We want to be able to reduce the impacts uh, those pests may have. And obviously if we don't have pests in the stuff we supply, uh, particularly our grain, that helps protect the markets if we're not getting things in there. And at a farm level, it's just about um, not introducing things that you then have to spend money to control later or the industry itself. So, I mean, there's a lot of practices in around biosecurity, but I guess the key ones that I, I want to talk about around harvest, and I've highlighted a few there, is you know that, that hygiene side of things, come clean, go clean onto the farm, making sure you have that regular pest monitoring plan that Phil mentioned, I'll touch on it. Keeping those records so you can actually um, keep track of your parcels of grain, but we also have a way of tracing things like residues or potential pests if there's an issue. And obviously from a biosecurity point of view and protecting our, our trade and um, market access is just anything that, that we um, see that's unusual trying to report it. So often in biosecurity, we talk about having a biosecurity plan and you know that's going to be different for each property. A lot of people do most of these things intuitively, or you can actually document them a little bit uh, more formally. I've got a couple of biosecurity signs over there, and that's probably one of the first steps is you know being able to control that movement of people and equipment onto your place, making sure people know what your requirements are if they're coming on. In terms of the two biosecurity signs, I mean this is what alerts people to the fact that you may have some requirements. We have the more traditional one, which is raising awareness and please contact us before you come on um, and giving a phone number where people can contact you or ask them to go to the office is a great place to start. More recently last year, some new regulations in around um, controlling trespass and being able to you know, get people or have people prosecuted if they um, breach a biosecurity plan. Um, this is a slightly different version of the sign. So it says that you actually have a documented plan in place. And to put a sign like that up, you need to demonstrate that you're actually controlling movements, usually by having something like a visitor's register and perhaps providing a clear farm map of where people can go and where they can't go in your place. And that gives you, I guess, more legal rights about controlling what people come on or off. But the key thing is, thinking about what it is you want to do and where people can and can't go. And the sign is, you know, one way of uh, helping that. And you can get hold of those through your, through your LLS offices or at the end, if you specifically want um, something like one of these, you can contact me, my contact details will be there. In addition to the signs, there's some good planners available. And generally a planner is gets you to think about things you you may not have considered, and as I mentioned, most people will do a, will have thought about a lot of these things and doing a lot of good practices. But some of the planners, like the one on the Farm Biosecurity website, allows you to actually put in the, the mix of things you have in your enterprise, whether you've got you know grazing, sheep, cattle, a number of different crops, and it'll bring up templates specifically that um, allow you to fill in some information. And I'm just going to touch on a couple of those and. Look, the planning and recording side of things are really probably the key to demonstrating what you're doing. So having a think about how things could get onto your place, how would a pest be introduced, 
is it going to be in the header? Um, uh, are those contractors' machines clean before they come on and not bringing pests onto your place? And if so, you know, how will you manage those? You know, where you segregate the first bit of material that comes out of those um, and keep it out of your storages. Keeping those records so you can trace back um, and also your vendor deck so we can sort of trace things forward or backwards if there's an issue with a particular parcel of grain. And so that segregation and record keeping allows it to maybe put back to an individual silo rather than everything that um, came off the actual farm. In terms of record keeping, I know Phil mentioned this as well. I really want to reinforce it that, you know, if you're monitoring what's going on um, in your storages on a regular basis and recording some of those key aspects, it puts you in good stead to be able to talk to the people that are purchasing your, purchasing your grain. And I guess the things you need to think about recording from a starting point at least is what's got to go into your vendor declaration and also what's required to be recorded from the product uh, labels that you're using for treatments, whether they're fumigations or grain protections. The other thing Phil mentioned, you know, whether it's an electronic or a hard copy, you know, identify each of your storages, whether you, you number them or give them an ID. Um, each one you want to try and record details about the volume and quality, so tons, moisture, grain, ten, protein, uh, grain, moisture content, protein, apologies. Any treatments that are put on, particularly the dates and durations, so that you can look at MRLs and know when that grain's available for marketing. Obviously, your monthly inspection notes and that, you know, getting the, the uh, trap in the top and a sample from the bottom or a spear from a, a shed and actually using some of the um, guides available to identify those insects so you can demonstrate, you know, that the, the labels that you're using, particularly grain protectants, may be suitable, suitable for the, the sorts of pests that are there. Any comments on quality? And obviously, if you can record the duration um, that you've run the fans for aeration, if that's not automated, and monitoring grain temperature will give an indication of how effective that aeration was, being, uh, was at the time. And I'd always ask myself, you know, what would the person buying your grain actually need to know? And the more information you can supply, the more confidence you can give the people purchasing from you. Um, just reiterating a couple of points from, from Phil's as well. You know, hygiene is a great starting point, eliminating those potential sources where pests could be established on farm and, and move into the new grain you've harvested, using those probe traps, using a sieve to actually get the insects out and identify them, and monitoring your, your grain temperature um, to keep an eye on what's happening in the storage. As I said, the lower that temperature can, can be, the more you can slow down the life cycle and at particular temperatures for each of the pests, you can actually stop them or slow down their breeding significantly, which reduces the increase in population. We're just mentioning a couple of those guides available. We've got one that you can get hold of through the, the um, Grain Farm Biosecurity Program or use the GRDC one uh, back pocket guide. So once you've got your sample, make sure you can become familiar with the things that you expect to see in there. There's a group of weevils, ones with the true snouts, things like sawtooth grain beetles, your lesser grain borers, and some of your flat or rusty red flower beetles. These are the things you'd actually expect to be able to find, and I would hope that everyone, if you've got a, a magnifying glass and you um, can actually sieve some stuff out and identify these, if you know what should be there or what you'd expect to be there, then it makes it much easier to spot anything that might be unusual. And that's that's the part where we want to look at um, things from a biosecurity point of view. You know, was the fumigation effective? Did you get survivors? Would you suspect that if you had a sealed silo when some of these guys survived with fumigation, you know, perhaps you'd think about sending a sample in to monitor the resistance? Or if there were things in there that you weren't sure about. Some of the other things, just going back to um, what's available in those planners, now, hints about um, cleaning vehicles, making sure that, you know, you don't bring vehicles on that don't have to be there or you might have parking bays or hard areas. You know, wash down where it's required, but, you know, at harvest time, we probably want ideally a good blowout um, with high-pressure air before, you know, 
a header and that comes on. I'm just thinking about where those things are done away from production areas and away from storages. And these are some of the key things that might be highlighted in your plan. Um, if you're specifically or predominantly a grain grower, we also have a biosecurity manual that goes through each of those areas that um, people can consider um, where they might be able to minimise some risks on farm. Anyone that wants to grab a copy of that grain uh, or the biosecurity manual for grain producers, just get in contact with me at the end. Um, final slide coming up for me, I've gone through reasonably quickly because I want to make sure we have some time for questions, but make sure you've got a guide for identifying your pests in storage. Make sure you're doing that regular sort of monthly monitoring, a, a, a trap um, in the top of the silo, getting samples from the bottom. Have a bit of a plan about how you're going to handle movement of things on and off the farm at harvest. At the end of the day, if you just ask yourself, if I was going to end up with new pests, where would they come from? Um, hopefully the first point is hygiene and around the farm and cleaning up potential sources on farm, treating storages so you can minimise new infestations. Then any equipment that comes on, make sure that that's actually cleaned. Um, and then if you're aware of the insects that should or not should be there, but that you may expect to find, it makes it much easier to identify something unusual and that's where we'd like people to report. So if you see anything in your, in your storages that doesn't look like those pests included in the regular guides, you can always give the exotic plant pest a hotline a call, um, or you can get in contact with biosecurity, or you can get in contact with your local LLS officers and they can put you in touch with us. And anyone chasing resources um, for, related to grain biosecurity can give me a call at the end. So I might leave my talk there to allow a bit of time for questions and I'll hand back to uh, Merrily and to Wendy, our facilitators. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bill. That was a great presentation and a really good message around how easy it is to actually implement some of the good biosecurity measures into your grain system. Um, so we're now moving into our question and answer session. So I invite any participant to type in any questions um, specifically to any of the topics that have been mentioned today. So now I am conscious of time and, and because of that reason, Bill and Phil, Philip have kindly said that they're happy to answer as many questions um, and hold on a bit longer in today's session to get through the questions. So if you do need to duck off because uh, we do go over time, this, this session is recorded as a reminder and all participants will receive the, the link. Um, so you can catch up and re-listen to this section if, if you do need to leave part way through. So, as I hand across to Neroli to facilitate this session, I'd like to ask the first question of Bill, if I can, and um, in, invite both Bill and, and Philip to um, open their webcams back up as well. Um, Bill, I was just wondering, for a producer, what's the best way for them, is it to, for a sample, is it to actually try and capture some of the live pests or is a, a photo better for identification purposes and and particularly if they're trying to send it say down to the biosecurity um, section there in, in Department of Primary Industries what, what what do you prefer? I think once you've got the monitoring if there's anything in there that you think is suspect if you can put it aside keep a sample um, quite often we we look at freezing those but a clear photo is probably the best starting point. The trouble is these guys are so small, um, you need a really good lens on your um, phone camera, um, or you can get some of those clip-on um, magnifying lenses for the, for the camera itself. But I guess a, a good photo is a starting point. Often our entomologists and self can look at those and get a clear idea. But if it's something quite unusual that you haven't seen before, I'd always say keep a sample um, usually whack it in the freezer to humanely keep them and then it's ready if we need you to send one in or we send someone to collect it if that is the case. Yes, look, I'd certainly support Bill's comments. Um, a good photo, even a couple of good photos from different angles of storage pests. So probably get two or three photos of storage pests sent to my phone each week 
um, just to check the identification. But yep, I think that's a very good starting point. And I like Bill's comment about keeping a sample of those insects in case we need it. And it can occur if there's something a little bit unusual, eventually we will certainly ask for a sample of the insects. Yeah, great. Thanks for that. Now, Bill, I've got another question that's come in um, in response to your presentation. The question being asked is, um, if you're asking your agronomist or contractors as they come on farm to wash down, what chemical should we be supplying for them? Is truck wash good enough? I think if they're coming on the farm and staying on formed up rows, then, then a general wash down is probably enough. If they're thinking about entering production areas and they've been on other farms, then your normal truck washers, provided that you've gotten all the soil and given it a thorough clean first, should be sufficient. But um, I would be inclined to try and keep um, vehicles out of production areas unless they actually had to be there. So good thing is to use a farm, farm vehicle that's already there switch but that's not always possible the second thing is keep people to formed up roads and keep them out of the areas where they're actually doing production if they need to be in there then a thorough clean and generally your truck washes at enough concentration provided you've gotten rid of all the residues that could be on there um, should be sufficient yeah great thank you for that uh, and phil i've got a question that's come through i think probably good for you to answer um, someone's asking, are there any new chemicals uh, in the pipeline that might be available to help with storage? Look, we are. Um, the research group here based in Brisbane is uh, continually um, working with other companies who are looking to introduce products. Look, one of the names, I think it's been in one of the publications in recent times, Flavicide. But just be aware these products do take uh, time before they're available on the marketplace. Um, and with a lot of these things, the, there's a lot of diversity in the, the genuses of the uh, storage pests. And so we rarely ever find uh, a single chemical active ingredient that covers the main six or seven storage pests. So in the case uh, I've just mentioned, it will almost always be a combination of active ingredients to control the pests. So the answer is yes, we are still looking uh, from time to time at new active ingredients. Um, uh, but I think uh, I would still aim not to look, you know, if I was planning for the next 10 or 20 years uh, in terms of um, my management of on-farm grain storage, I'd certainly focus on those four points I mentioned and look towards fumigants and gases rather than uh, a total reliance on, um, they'll always have a place, but I think with uh, international markets particularly being more restrictive on residues, I would make it my plan with my own farm storage to work towards uh, gas type storage so you can effectively use a gas and there's quite a few different gases it's not just phosphine I'm sure some of you have used profume or sulfur fluoride and there's other choices nitrogen or uh, co2 which are fairly common and other gases that have been researched in previous years as well so that would be my overall comment don't just look towards chemicals to spray on grains because there's a lot of pressure to reduce residue yeah, great. Thanks, Phil. Um, I've got another question coming in around farm hygiene. Uh, you mentioned dry side for the use in uh, silos and sheds, but the question is around um, other machinery. So use your header or your auger. Is dry side the best option um, for sort of keeping those clean? Look, good question. Um, yes, we do try and stay with even using dry side for augers and and other uh, machinery as well headers yeah uh, really they say with harvesters and this has been a recommendation around diatomaceous earth or dry side for many years which is clean out as much of the residues as you can out of a header at the end of the harvest um, 
And we all know that that's certainly not going to get everything. We'd have to have a major overhaul of a header to actually get everything. But so there's always going to be grain generally in a header. So and then use that blowback gun and the compressor to blow dust in, and then obviously carefully um, just slowly turn over the equipment to distribute some of that dust right throughout the as much of the header as you can. Because I think we did a trial a number of years ago. All five headers we checked all of them at the beginning of the harvest had storage pests and one in particular after we'd sampled the first 40 litres of wheat that went into that uh, header at the beginning of the season we stopped counting after counting a thousand lesser grain borers in those first 40 litres so just be aware um, dryers graders all sorts of machinery that gives shelter augers you mentioned um, yes, I would be using dry side um, uh, either as the slurry or the dust. Great, right, thanks, Phil. Um, and this looks like it will be the last question, unless some people put in some quick last-minute questions. This one's around aeration, Phil. Um, if we have, um, how does high humidity, sorry, impact on aeration? Um, if we've got humidity or air moisture. Is it going to limit the running of aeration in that system? Ah, yes. <laughs> That's a, a question um, would probably take me more like 20 minutes to deal with properly. But look, let's try and do a very short answer. Your modern controllers, which do a very efficient aeration control, do a very efficient job, actually trigger turning the fan on using wet bulb not dry bulb, which the old traditional aeration controls use. So certainly relative humidity is a very important part of when fans should or shouldn't be running. Um, just around some details, an air automatic aeration controller actually allows the controller to select air up to 85% relative humidity. But just a couple of points here. Yes, remember the coldest air, you know, six in the morning, is quite high relative humidity. You still want to be able to use that cold air and exploit that. Um, but I think it's always a helpful reminder. People get a bit shocked. You know, 85% humidity, Phil. I said, no. Look, it's the average of the relative humidity that that fan is running for. That's the important thing in terms of aerating. So, and the other point I'd make, so yes, we grab some of that very cold air up to 85% humidity, which is useful, but we also find the automatic controller, because it's using wet bulb to trigger fan run times, it will also take air that might be say 25, 27, 28 degrees outside. But like yesterday, I was looking at my controller, the relative humidity, was right down under 30% relative humidity. So that if the controller will select that as well because dry air pushed over grain, which has a moisture content, 12% or whatever, is exactly the same as an evaporative cooling effect. So you push that dry air over that grain in the silo and it will certainly cool that grain well below that 27 or 28 degrees that's outside. So to try and answer the question in as short as I can, it's the combination of temperature and relative humidity that works. And um, in general, <laughs> I know for very small operations in terms of storage, manual operation is probably a, a reasonable choice, but for most commercial storage situations on farm, there's no way I would do anything like as an efficient a job as an automatic controller would do as selecting the right ear. So I'd strongly encourage growers to seriously consider if they haven't got a good quality automatic controller to make use of them. You'll find you'll get a lot more efficient cold air. It will select the best 100 hours each month to run the fan. So. Yep, it's uh, not as simple as we might like to think when you're selecting air is probably the best way to finish. Hopefully that's answered a bit of it, but you're more than welcome to ring that 1800 Weevil number. And the other co quick comment I'd make is there's a really nice 
four page, very well illustrated and explained uh, uh, note called how aeration works. So if you just type into Google how aeration works and include storedgrain.com.au, you'll bring that note up and just download the PDF. Mm. Thanks, Philip. That's um, that's a great great way to end the question time. And uh, thank participants for sending in those really good depth of questions. I think to our speakers today. So we'll um, we'll wrap things up there. If you'd like to get hold of Philip or Bill um, from today's presentation, certainly you can contact them on their contact details, which are on your screen now. So. I'd strongly encourage producers to, as Philip said, use the 1800 Weevil number or contact Bill, Bill on his um, contacts there. Also available to New South Wales producers across the state, there is a fantastic network of local land services, ag advisory staff who can assist uh, any producer with their grain storage inquiries and help also link you in with Philip or Bill and any of the extension material um, that is available to you. So feel free to give the local land services ag staff a call. That brings us to the end of today's webinar. And this is the last of our two part webinars for the series for on farm grain storage. I'd like to thank Philip Burrell and Bill Gordon for their time today and also for their involvement in presenting across the series. And also thanks to Nerily Brennan for co-facilitating with me today. If um, I look forward to hosting and hearing feedback about our series today and from Wednesday's event. So until next time, thank you very much.